Hello. All right, I'm going to admit everyone. Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Good to see some new faces, some new names. We have a few people kind of joining in as we go. Yep. Um, but it is it is great to see everybody here tonight. Let's just give it another yes. seconds or so. It's late for some stragglers. Hey, Rick. Elise, unmute yourself so I can hear your voice. Hi, Harold. Unmute yourself. <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> Elise, how long has it been? A few years? Two, two or Probably three like at least ago? three years, right? Yeah. Probably two years. I think nice two at least. You. you too. Awesome. All right, you guys. Well, let me give my my spiel as we uh as we um are well you might want to, last people you might want to just just a few you might as well wait you know two minutes okay sounds good we did so have we're expecting we said some last minute signups as well so we'll uh give them another right. give them another minute Hello. okay Hi, Antonio. <laughs> Antonio, Maria Teresa is saying hello to you. Great. I guess you know each other. Yeah. How, how are your rabbits? <laughs> My rabbits, Lauretta and Rinuccio, are fine. <laughs> and I hope everybody knows where I got those names from. Yep. <laughs> if you're all musicians. Yeah. What are the names? Rinuccio and Lauretta. Well, probably some opera, but I can't. Uh, I can't answer that. Okay, who wants the prize? Who can name it? <laughs> Danis Kiki. Thank you, Antonio. Ooh. Bravissimo. Wow. Lauretta sings the famous aria. Any sopranos on here? O mio babbino caro. Maria and Cabo. her beloved is Rinuccio. So what does he get? <laughs> okay, yes, my bunnies. Um, yeah, nice to see you, Antonio. It's been a been a not very busy time. Huh? Yeah. Are you both singers? Uh, in both my case, I was a freelance, uh, a liturgical musician, pianist. Uh, you know, cantor, pianist, organist. I covered for uh, Antonio's wife last summer. I thought maybe I'd be doing that again this summer, <laughs> but <laughs> COVID had other plans for us. Yeah. No. yeah. I was very busy covering on weekends and... Uh... Okay. We... Okay. All righty. Hello, you yeah. everyone. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we're working on um, the session is for preparing Brahms Requiem um, by Harold Rosenbaum. I think all of you may know him. We might have some new faces though. Um, and just so everybody knows, there'll be a live Q&A at the end of the session that's open to everyone. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and Harold will call on you to answer. Um, since there are so many of us, we have put everyone on mute uh, and I'll continue to put you on mute um, throughout the session uh, just to avoid any extra feedback in and background noise. But if you want to unmute yourself to communicate with Harold during the se session, you can hold down the space bar, which will unmute yourself when you're talking. Releasing the space bar will then mute yourself again automatically. If this feature for any reason doesn't work on your computer, you can use the microphone bottom that's on the left bottom part of your screen. 
Beyond the Q&A tonight, um, which is different than our previous sessions, Harold has offered to be available for any additional questions or comments that you may have. Simply email Harold at haroldrosenbaum at gmail.com and he'll set up a time to talk with you via phone or Zoom meeting. We'll be sending over more information about the organization and about Harold to the chat box, which includes a donation link. Harold is giving all of these sessions free to the public and therefore any and all donations are greatly accepted and appreciated. These donations go to Canticorum Virtuosi Inc, which is the um, organization that provides funding for both of Harold's New York based choirs. Uh, and these donations are tax deductible. Please also use this chat box or the email that we've been communicating with you um, to request any technological assistance throughout the session. Lastly, as always, we'll be recording and archiving every video, so you'll have the opportunity to revisit the material from tonight's session at your leisure. We'll send the video link to you, um, to your email after today's meeting, most likely tomorrow morning, and we hope that you enjoy this wonderful series. Great, uh, and next week, we wanna talk about next week, Oh yeah, I was going to say at the end, but it's good to, in case we lose anybody, has to leave early. Next week, we will, Harold will not be hosting any sessions because it is election night. Um, so please go out and vote. Um, and um, we will be doing a Q&A on Instagram um, for Harold. Any questions you have about any piece of music ever um, or about his history, his past, his professional life. Um, so we're going to be doing that next week on Thursday. So um, even though we don't have a session, please stay in touch, check our social media, and um, then we'll see you in two weeks from today for our next Zoom session. Right, and the Instagram session is from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And so uh, feel free. Just a, a technical question. Um, is it possible to uh, have me see other people who I can't see now? So, of who, whoever wants to be seen. So go to your- It's not necessary, but- it, Who do you see right now, Harold? Angela, Alessandro, Ralph Gorda. Oh, who do I see? Yeah. I see Brian and Celeste and, and Antonio and Maria. Yeah, Elise, Rick, Rick Hyman and myself and you. You see everyone? No, I don't see Renee, Lillian. Oh, they Ralph, have, they have Angela. their video oh. camera off. So we can ask if you have your camera off and you're able to turn it on, that would be awesome. So we can see your faces, but they, they might have it off for- it's not, for not necessary, but I just felt it might- Okay, yeah. great. What's awesome. that? Okay. Okay, I, I didn't hear what you said, Don. You see, yes, you, okay, I see you. Okay, just um, one quick clarification. It's it's not so much that Canticorum Virtuosi, which is the corporate name, provides funding. I mean, it's just a it's just a name. Under uh, uh, my choirs are under the umbrella of that not for profit. Uh, we have to raise all the money ourselves. You know, the, we don't have uh, an organization that funds us. Okay, now. Uh, here we are. I've conducted the Brahms Requiem uh, once <clears throat> um, in 1983. And about 15 years later, maybe, yeah, about 15 or 16 years later, I prepared my two college choirs. I believe it or not, I was technically full time at the University at Buffalo and Queens College. And I prepared both choir, I trained them separately and prepared them for performance with the New York Youth Symphony in Carnegie Hall, which somebody else conducted. So um, I'm not a musicologist. I'm, I'm not here to give you a history of this or things like that, except to say um, uh, that Brahms' mother died a few months, two months before he wrote this and he gave him much grief and very, you know, most scholars agree that uh, that inspired him to write this uh, this requiem, which is uh, not a liturgical traditional, you know, requiem. It's not the Roman Catholic text. It's a, it's called the German requiem. He chose the text himself, and um, and you know, it focuses on the living, 
Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Two, two months after he, his mother died, he finished, he already completed three movements. Um, but what I'm gonna do tonight is not demonstrate conducting or ask you to do it. That's what I've been doing in past weeks. I just wanna make believe I have a choir in front of me. And, and by the way, when I, I, I've conducted every piece that I'm gonna be talking about throughout this whole season. Um, but I haven't looked at the score in 22 years. And I just today, I just looked at it just to see if I had translation. So in other words, I didn't study it again. I want it to be fresh in my mind. I want it to be um, sort of emulate uh, the, uh, the, the idea that I'm approaching it fresh and, you know, and what do I see right away that stands out that I think about before I dare to step in front of a choir and certainly before an orchestra. So that's what I'll be talking about. Very technical things that singers should think about and conductors should think about. Now, first of all, sometimes, um, well, you wanna put the score up? Yeah, let's put the score up. First page. Ziemlich langsam und mit Ausdruck. So somewhat slow and with expression. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at my full score. This is a, what you're looking at is a, um, you know, piano reduction, two piano reduction from uh, cpdl.org, but it should be, you know, my concept should, should apply and, and be uh, the same. You'll see them. What I was gonna say was sometimes um, before I start conducting a movement, any movement of anything, I uh, it might be a little bit difficult to come up with a tempo, especially when you're standing on stage in front of an audience. And sometimes uh, ahead of time, you realize that if you just think of a particular passage, you'll get the tempo. Now, you don't have to turn to it now, we'll see it later, but there is a passage uh, in Mesta 39, Den sie sollen getröstet, um, that uh, blessed are they that mourn, they shall, um, they shall have comfort. And it's just that particular, those particular two or three measures, it is, I, uh, I have sort of locked in my brain how exactly fast I want that to go. Therefore, I think of, I actually hear that, those two measures before I start conducting the very, very opening of this piece. Now, you have no way of knowing by looking at this, but there is um, there are two horns in F, French horns, which sustain F natural, concert F naturals for five and a half measures. And this is really slow. And so, you know, you gotta think of the players once in a while, right? So, you know, if you want it really, really slow, you gotta ask them if they can really hold that note that long without breathing. I don't think Brahms wanted them to breathe. Uh, the French one is generally the glue of the orchestra. That's just a thought. Um, so it's very slow. So obviously, you know, all, one pickup, only one pickup is necessary. So that's it. Legato. Um, and you can, oh, let me get, let me uh, put my, images of you tucked away that's so I can see the score better. You know, each each part comes in. Um, it even says legato, is that Brahms's marking? I don't know, because it's italicized in my score and your score there. But who would not do this legato? The strings come in one at a time. One thing I want to say, let's go to the next page or, or, or at least um, measure 10, nine and 10. You see those hairpins? something like in measure, uh, the second measure I'm staring at, whichever measure that is there. Um, you see those uh, quick crescendos and quick decrescendos. You'll see that a lot in Brahms's music. You know, you won't see that and you won't do that effect obviously in Baroque music very much or at all, or, you know, basically not, but here we are in the 19th century and uh, we'll come back to this concept later because sometimes um, there's a big crescendo and it goes right through 
a note which has a weak syllable under it, and yet he wants you to crescendo to the very end. So you're not really thinking of the text at that moment, but you're thinking of the effect. And that's what happens much more, I think, in the uh, 19th century than earlier. However, I can think of Baroque pieces uh, and even Renaissance pieces and classical pieces, which, um, which have that, that kind of effect, but it's mostly at the very end of a piece and not so much within movements and within phrases. Um, let's just go to where the chorus first comes in. So that's measure whatever it is, 15 or so. Okay, so you're conducting the orchestra. You have to give, you have to give the chorus, you have to prepare the chorus for the entrance. You can't just, I wouldn't just, you know, turn to the cellos and conduct the bassoon and suddenly go like this for the chorus. I wouldn't give them only a one measure gesture. Um, in other words, it's not just the shoulders and arms that we're talking about. It's the whole mechanism for making the singers aware that they're about to come in, that we, I want them to come in. Harold? So I, yes. Um, Richard has a question. Um, Richard, if you want to unmute yourself. Or, or I can just ask his question. Hold on, you got to ask, unmute. Yeah, uh, just hold out, that's it. Yeah, uh, I just found this full score, but my question was, are there more than one horn playing the F? I want to. Yeah, but they're oct an octave apart. Oh, they're an octave apart, that's what I, yeah, that's what I was thinking yeah. about. Um, you know, a lot of times there's a sub, sub horn an assistant horn sitting next to them and they can stagger <laughs> the breathing is that yeah yeah it's like it's like uh, in choruses they can spot i think they call it spot them yeah yeah that's, yeah. I've, 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 that's interesting thank you for yeah. that my guess is that's what they do you know that's great it that long that's is good really crazy so i can take this even slower than i than uh, I can. <laughs> <laughs> unnerve them, you know. <laughs> Thank you for that. Now, going back to saying, you know, you can do this to the chorus. In other words, get ready. You can turn slowly to them. You can look at them like, you know, that's very easy. Um, I'm sure some of you, are, some of you uh, have German that's better than mine, but I, I have a pretty good understanding of the of pronunciation. And uh, so obviously, you know, you spend a lot of time with people who, um, who might not know German so well and explaining things to them like final Ds or Ts, like Zelig, Zint. By the way, that's a really good spot um, to get a really, uh, uh, maybe a louder t, t on Zint than you would normally have them because it's homophonic and there's almost nothing happening. Everybody else is playing pianissimo. It's just a nice way to introduce the audience to the fact that this chorus is gonna have really good diction. Now here's, um, and you know, you have to explain to them that in German, every word that begins in German should be approached, uh, no, every word in German, which begins with a vowel should be approached with a glottal, a glottal stop. So uh, there aren't any here yet, but you know, I'll get to that later um, to demonstrate that. But um, as opposed to Latin, where the, there are no glottals, I have a fly here. Oh well. Okay. So um, the next thing I want to say is in measure 20, 20, 20. Yeah, to the right, the second entrance. Um, it's really important. As I said, uh, S-I-N-D is zint. It's a T and that is followed by D-I-E, -D so it's D. A T and a D is great to hear. Now, some people, some singers might want to implode without going into too much de detail, implode the first consonant so that it's like the implode the so you don't really hear the, the T. And I, I don't like that as much as I like really um, 
giving as much as you can. Um, with amateur choirs, you know, L E I D with a crescendo, a lot of them might go to the second half, second half of the diphthong too soon. They might go light, like, you know, Frank Sinatra, strangers in the night, exchanging glances. So you have to, you know, bring that out. Um, here's an example that I mentioned before already, is it pops up here where uh, the word is tragen, tragen. And yet he has a crescendo right up into the downbeat, which is fine because that's what he wants, you know. And if you look at the other parts, I was looking at the soprano just now, but if you look at the um, other parts, I mean, that's what he wants. He wants a general crescendo um, and the uh, second secondary secondary is the text really at that point when he wants that. Um, is it necessary to write espressivo? I don't know if he did that. Um, nothing wrong with writing espressivo to me, legato. You know, to me, all music is expressive unless uh, unless it's not legato necessarily. Well, it's a long story. I mean, most music I think is by default legato, but that's fine to do that. Um, okay, and of course, it's not uh, so many so many singers would, would sing not not knowing. Uh, they would sing tragen. It's not tragen, you know, it's a tragen, it's a schwa. Tragen, right? And you come away. Okay, let's let's scroll down a little bit to the next system. Okay. Now you have now you have to uh, decide as a conductor. You have to tell your singers how much of a breath you want them to do. Uh, altos and basses. You know, should it be a quarter or an eighth? Well, a quarter would get them an a nice amount of breath. It's been a long phrase, but then the tenors can't take a quarter. The tenors have to take a breath note before den. So a breath, uh, an eighth breath before den. So perhaps it would be better to have the alto and bass also take an eighth so the lower parts can be not just doing the same thing, but they're, they're supporting the soprano, which starts to emerge as more of a solo line. And they're, they're more of a unit if they take an eighth, if they all take an eighth. Now, if you want to give the altos and basses um, quarter breaths, that's okay also. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but I've, I've done things like that. And then the tenors would stand out, but not for too long. You know, they're really only standing out for a, a 16th of a second or so because they have to breathe. I mean, there's a consonant at the end of G-E-N. So they got to place the consonant and breathe and so the, you'd only hear the tenor sticking out for a, a very, very, very brief moment. And it really basically never bothers me uh, unless you have the opportunity to have all three, you know, unless it's really clear here that the all three can very, very well um, breathe together. Okay. And of course, uh, it's not Zolin, it's Zolin. Zolin, because a double consonant, you know, uh, makes for a darker vowel before it. Um, and he doesn't put a decrescendo. Brahms doesn't before D E N. That's two before A, but you should, as a conductor, you should. The basses don't need it; they leap down a fifth. The sopranos need it, the tenors need it, because especially with a college, you know, choir. The kids not that experienced. The tenors are going to go. You know, the, no sense of phrasing. You might even want to put the horizontal line underneath V you know, V-E-R, a W-E-R, the note that's on top of that in the lower three parts. Even, even the soprano. A crescendo might not quite be enough. If you want that note actually accented slightly, which I think is a good idea, then I don't think a crescendo is quite enough for the sopranos because you want them to have the same concept that you're gonna accent that W-E-R slightly. And here we are at letter A with something, again, you, you just don't see in, in Mozart and Bach, you know, he wants a quick crescendo and decrescendo. And you have to rehearse that, you know, because that's not easy to do. Uh, they might know, they might not know exactly how long the crescendo should be. It's the, probably the whole thing takes an eighth note, believe it or not. So a crescendo followed by a decrescendo. Let me turn my alarm off. Okay. Um, also, you know, uh, generally speaking throughout, I've mentioned this in past lectures, um, when there's a crescendo, 
like in measure 2024, 20, um, going to 25. I like to think that the composer, if, if, there, if there is not a, a specific dynamic indicated at the peak of the crescendo wants you to go one notch up. But in letter A, I, I, I think even because it's Brahms and 19th century, you might even, even though it's a very short hairpin, you might even want to or like think of a mezzo forte peak instead of mezzo piano. Blessed. Okay. So I think we can go to the next, um, the next movement because I would love to cover all seven movements um, tonight. So this is um, she'll get that. So um, yeah, the, now the mutes are on. Ah, here we are. All flesh is like grass. All flesh is as grass, and all. Goodliness of man is as the flower of grass. That sounds good. Uh, there's more to it later. Let's just start with that. And the question is, how much of a pickup should you give? Can you just scroll down? Yeah, thank you. Is it enough just to go? I think so, just to give the second beat, they come in on a third beat. If you wanna be really accurate, I don't see anything really wrong with going like this. Giving a small downbeat and a larger second beat, keeping it pianissimo, but a slightly larger second beat. If you're going to give two preps, I always suggest doing the first one a little bit smaller. So um, yeah, and then um, yeah, they're muted until way deep into the movement. They're muted, but let's go to the um, to the choral entrance. Well, here. <laughs> This is a really good thing to discuss. I mean, most, well, you know, most young people would sing Dena, 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 Dena. No, alles, all, the word all, all, all has to have a glottal. Dena, because that's the way you speak it. And that's really important. Uh, let's go, let's go down one staff, staff I mean, uh, system. In alles gleich, es ist grass. So the question is, how much of a breath? At this tempo, um, I can easily see taking an, an eighth breath because there's plenty of time to breathe. However, there are other considerations, you know? Um, it's a weighty statement. It's a mighty statement. I mean, it's soft, but, you know, they're all singing it together. Turn on this nice I think they should cut up on the second beat. I do. Um, instead of grass. even though um, a lot of the instrumental instruments, the the the, um, the flutes, the oboes, clarinet, they have two quarter notes, as you can see in the accompaniment. Yeah, and they have to take an eighth breath. I still think that can work very well. Usually that's not, an, I wouldn't say that with Bach uh, as much. Except if, the, if in Bach, the viola is actually doubling the alto part and the altos breathe, yeah, you want it to match. But here they're a little bit, a little bit independent. Um, okay, and here again, he has, you know, bit long crescendos, long decrescendo. So don't even worry that, you know, you might go scroll down a bit to the next system, uh, the decrescendo. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, look, um, let me review something. I, I, I mentioned a few weeks ago, something called a choral crescendo, whereby um, if it's a long crescendo, not every, not every note necessarily has to be louder than the previous one, but rather you can come down a little bit within a long crescendo to uh, to a weak syllable, like das Gras ist verdorret. But he wants again. He wants das Gras ist verdorret. He wants this effect. So let's um, abide by that. 
Okay, let's look at, uh, let's go back to the first measure on this page, blue man, off. Obviously, obviously to me, uh, the tenor and bass should cut off with the alto. So M-E-N is an eighth note. Why didn't composers put that in? I don't know. I've asked them a lot. I took a survey once, um, let me turn my, um, my phone off, I'm sorry. Um, when I commissioned 25 uh, composers to, to celebrate the anniversary of my 25th anniversary of my professional chorus and including 12 Pulitzer Prize winners. And I asked them the question, you know, it had to do with tying, tying notes to rest. No, let me think. Um, yeah, like a quarter note tied to an eighth. Does that mean you cut off on the eighth or after the eighth? And a third of them said after the eighth and a third of them said on the, you know, on it and a third of them said whatever. So, you know, just interpret. Composers can't put everything in. Um, okay, let's go, let's go down to the next system. Yeah, I like that. They have a nice arch down to, uh, down to the, um, the weak syllable. So I think, um, let's go to the fast part, um, which is letter C, which is measure 96. Keep going, keep going. 96. Letter, uh, letter C, I think you passed it. Maybe not. Your, oh, your letters are different from mine. So measure numbers we'll stick with. Wait a minute, what's going on? Oh, 70, keep going. Oh, there it is, there it is, there it is. Oh yeah, letter C. Back, back, you had it. It disappeared, there it is, stop, okay. So the question is, you know, etwas bewegter means uh, rather moving, obviously a little faster. The question is, the first question I ask myself is, should that begin on the downbeat or on the pickup? So let me just sing the alto part uh, uh, on, the, on the page. Uh, so dun 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 or one two. So dun dun. You know, you know what I mean. Like, is the pickup in the new tempo or not? My, I'm, I lean towards saying yes. It doesn't make too much sense to me to go one two. So dun dun. But you know, there are exceptions to every rule. You know. Um, Commas don't necessarily mean you breathe. I would not um, breathe after geduldig. It just happens too soon. So can you scroll down as I'm singing? So seit nun geduldig on Yeah, I think I hear this as, you know, all in one breath. So again, be careful of that, um, of thinking that automatically uh, commas mean breath. By the way, in my full score, I have um, I have cues all over the place. Um, for example, the horn in at letter letter D. Yeah, go. Can you go on just a bit? Letter D. Uh, actually, it's measure ninety nine. Wait, that's too far. That's too far. Go back. Well. You don't really have to have to go back because you don't you don't have the full orchestration. But you know the horn hasn't played for a while. You need ninety nine, so right on. Yeah, measure ninety nine. So you know, right on top. If I if you saw my score, I mean, right on top of the soprano. I don't know if you can see it. I just have like an arrow pointing up to the horn part with the word horn on it uh, next to the arrow. I just, you know, give myself those cues all the time. And the harp, the harp hasn't played for quite a while. What's a harp doing in this? But there is one. And this is um, the first time it plays since it was predicted. Okay, let's go on. Um, 
Let's go on to the next movement. Well, there's a fast part here. Wait one second. Um, yeah, let's go to letter. You know something? We're not going to have time for the whole thing if we if we don't move on. Let's just go to the third movement. It's the great baritone solo. Um, of course, you want to hire a great bass or baritone or bass baritone um, who can who roll the R's. I think all professional singers can roll R's. As I said a few weeks ago, there, there are two reasons why I'm not a great opera singer. I can't. I physically cannot roll R's, and my voice is horrible. Other than that, I would have been a great opera singer. But uh, that's when my I can't do it. My wife can do it. My daughter can do it. I cannot roll R's. Okay, that's neither here or there. So um, you conduct this in two, obviously, and the horn started. So you give the second beat, they come in. Um, sh should you keep conducting or let the bass you know, rule? No, of course not. You keep conducting. You have to, you have an orchestra there. And you don't, you don't want to let soloists run amok as, more than you have to. You know, it's bad enough that I'm not able to conduct recitatives. Oh God, I have to let them take over, but that's that's okay. They deserve it and that's standard and why should I interfere? But here you wanna keep conducting. Um, again, there are a lot of uh, long crescendos and day crescendos. Here, let's look at um, measure 54. Or actually 50, uh, 40, 47, 47. Okay, 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 good. Z, uh, Z, that's measure 48, where the chorus comes in. There, stop, stop there. Okay, um, so, okay, so, he has a soprano taking a breath before minor, M-E-I-N-E, -E. um, see, see my days, C-S-E-E, -E, that my days are as a hand breath to thee. He has the sopranos taking a breath, obviously. I mean, they're out for a half measure. See, one, minor, two. But the lower three parts continue. It might be a nice idea to have a slight lift in the lower three parts to, um, to sort of not counteract, but to reinforce actually what's gonna happen with the soprano. So like the altos, you know, to, to conform with what the soprano is doing on a lesser scale, something to think about. How do you notate that in your score or the scores you're gonna hand out or you're gonna, Purchase scores. You're gonna, but you're gonna mark yours up. You're gonna scan it. You're gonna send it to your singers and have them transfer marks into their scores. Um, I think instead of putting an eighth rest after H E in measure forty, whatever that's the first measure on the page, in the lower three parts, you might want to just put a little vertical line intersecting the top two lines of the staff or so. To me, that means a very short pause, but not a breath. Um, now there's a crescendo in measure 56. Yeah, 50, yeah, 50, und mein Leben, keep going, keep going because the peak seems to be, you know, where the forte is. So there's a long crescendo going like, you know, six measures. And I think it's really, really fine to plow right through the B-E-N twice. Und mein Leben, mein Leben. <laughs> There's no need for subtlety there to come away from Leben, Leben. There's no re reason for it. It's part of the great drama of 19th century, the certain type of drama of 19th century music. Um, okay. Then there's a long fugal section at the end. Um, let's look at measure 164. C. 
64 or 164? 164. 164. Way ahead of this. Like at least five or six pages ahead of this. I think you're going backwards. I could be wrong. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. You're almost there. Keep going. It's with the. Okay. 164. Yeah, good. That's it. Now, right before this, actually go up so we can see what happens right before this. You have the um, trombone and the cello and basses coming in on a, on a half note pre preceded by a, a fermata, everybody else. So how do you conduct this? Well, that last measure before the double bar line, it's one, two, right? And then you give another two while you cut off the players or not, There's a, there are two ways of doing it, but you have to go one, two, here's a fermata and then two, three, and they come in on three. Um, or you can have no break, like don't go one, two, off. You don't want, if you don't want silence, then just go one, two, two, three. You see, you're cutting the, you're cutting those who have the formata off on three when the others come in, so there's no break. It's up to you. Um, and then you have crescendo molto. But let's let's look at the transition into the next section. From just go ahead a little bit. Go ahead um, to measure one seventy two, going to one seventy three. Right. Um, so here's the end of this line. It's the last two measures here. Wait, stop, stop. The last two measures. Da G. It's a soprano part. Da, 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 da. Now, now. It, now it says cut time, but nobody in his right mind, hold on, go back up, please. Nobody in his right mind would conduct this me these measures in two. Oh wait, no, so yeah, go, go down, go down one. It says cut time. Would you really go one? Dun, 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 dun. Look at all those eighth notes that the, the strings have, the, the violins right away have an eighth rest and then eighth notes. So leading up to it, you have one, two, you don't have to move. Yeah, you can see the, you can see the piano part there. So it's two measures, one, two. Wait, before I do this, you have to figure out what the relationship is between half note, previous half note and the following half note or quarter, quarter, right? So, since there's no indication that quarter equals half or anything like that, you have to assume that the half equals the half. So one, two, three, one, two, three, da -dun 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 -da -dun 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 da 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 Right. It goes, you conduct it in four instead of three. It's as simple as that. It's the same beat. Two, three, one two, three, just so you know. All right, um, let's look at the very end of this movement. Yeah, let's look at if we could, right before measure, movement four, we're not gonna cover everything tonight, but we, we can't possibly in this amount of time, but still a lot of concepts of running by you. Um, Harold, Harold, yeah. I just have a question. Yes, Why would he? What? Why wouldn't he just write it as four two? Who the heck knows? I'm not a musicologist. I don't know. Oh, I just so don't confusing. know the answer to that. Yeah. Okay. That's weird. That's why I'm okay. here, Elise. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that Elise? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> is that Elise? Yep, you know. Elise, it. I miss you. She took how many? You took two or three of my workshop, my five day workshop. I did um, two of huh? the conducting, I did two of the conducting ones and then the third one I just sang. So I okay. Yeah. Okay, you can move on now. Okay. Sorry. 
Okay, I'll move on now. <laughs> so the very end of the movement, um, obviously he doesn't mock retardando, which does not mean you should not retard, retard right? Um, the question is how much subdivision do you wanna do? So, uh, you know, here's the next to the last measure. That's probably enough just to subdivide the third and fourth beats. Big ending. Okay, the fourth movement. We'll go for another five or 10 minutes. We can ask, you can ask questions. Uh, be careful with this one. I have in my score slower HR. HR does not mean human resource, it means Harold Rosenbaum. I'm telling myself to be to do it slower because uh, you know, when you're up in front of an audience, your adrenaline is flowing and you just have to really take your time. I keep thinking of Leonard Bernstein uh, and mentioning him. He just takes his time to set the tempo in his mind. My soul longs for the courts of the Lord. Um, so do you want to just go? That would do it. You know, the clarinets, oboes, and flutes come in on the, well, no, the clarinets and the flutes come in on the third beat. Nobody else does. Do you need to do one, two? You know, it would relieve a little bit of anxiety to, for, in the players' minds, I think. If you tell them ahead of time, you're going to give two beats prep, one and two. You know, some of you might be instrumentalists and you disagree. I don't know. I just think they can certainly come in if you give only the second beat, but it, there's less anxiety, I think, if you give them one and two. But that's what I wanted to say there. Um, oh, let's look at um, letter A, measure 20. Five or so. So, 25. Okay, here we go. Now it says espressivo. So tenor, tenors sing this. It says, it says espressivo. To me, to me, besides the obvious, you know, sing it expressively. Like, why wouldn't they sing it expressively, right? But it gives you the liberty to tell them to do things like this. I'll, I'll actually demonstrate it and I'll, I'll exaggerate it. So you can see what I'm after. See what I did? I just did a hairpin on that first note. And then in the second measure, I did a, did a little crescendo towards the end of the measure. Besides what he wrote, you know, in addition to the crescendo marks he puts in. Um, and uh, yeah, and in fact, I. If you listen to recordings, I think you'll hear that in this movement, uh, there's a little, little crescendo, a natural crescendo. That's important because in general, when you um, study music, as, as most of you know, I sing through, I've sung through every single voice part in every single one of the, what, 5,000 or 6,000 pieces I've conducted over the last 47 years. And I mark these things in the way I want, the way I hear it and the way I want them to do it. I mark it in. Exactly, the crescendo goes for two beats, decrescendo for one beat, whatever. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Let's look at uh, measure 50, 50. <coughs> Okay, good, look at that. Go back uh, 49. Okay, so the, it's a little imitative passage. Basses have Now, let's go down <clears throat> to the next system. Uh, in my score, yeah, here too, it's, you see a crescendo. Actually, my crescendo starts one measure before, two notes before that. So whatever, um, wait, yeah, doesn't matter. Let's look at the, the third measure on the page. And you have to decide whether you want a, a crescendo, a typical 
crescendo or you want a choral crescendo. In other words, let's, before I can answer that, if you can scroll down one more system and then we'll come back to this one. I wanna see where the crescendo ends. So it ends here in the second measure on the page. So it's a, a one measure crescendo plus what's back, go back now. And we see a, um, you know, for the tenors and basses, it's a four, it's a little more than a four, four measures of crescendoing. So isn't it possible you can go und zenet, verlanget, in other words, coming away a little bit to the weak syllables and still maintain a general crescendo. It's something you have to think about because it might be okay, you know, just to barrel through weak syllables in a crescendo also. Especially if the orchestra is doubling you and playing a crescendo through every note is louder than the previous one. Or you might separate the two and have the audience hear the orchestra doing a general crescendo and the chorus coming away to the weak syllables, which will highlight the chorus in a sense, even though they're coming away, it'll, it'll be uh, an expressive device. And isn't that an interesting concept that you don't have to match um, the two? To me, that's very interesting. Um, let's just look at the opening of the fifth movement. And then, uh, well, yeah, in fact, let's go to the, the last two measures of this movement before we go to the fifth. Yeah, just one page back would be great. In my score, I have, uh, see the, the winds sustain the last three measures, it's one note sustained, but the, the strings in the next to the last measure um, have a dotted half and then, then a fermata on the last note. So you might want to actually have an, a big gap. I guess they're changing bows directions, but more of a gap than normal for the for the strings. You can hold the other players and do this. So you cut off the strings and give them the final downbeat while holding the other players. It's just a thought. Uh, and so in my score, I, I mark that with caesura, parallel diagonal lines. Okay, the next movement, and then we can stop. Um, well, you know, obviously you want to give, you want to give two beats, you want to give, you know, two prep gestures, the first one being the second beat, and the third one being the third beat, and they come in on the end of three, right? So it's two, three, da, da, da. I'll do that again. Two, Great. Uh, right. Consuadino muted. Um, yeah. Again, in in measure nineteen, I just want to emphasize a couple of things in terms of the words. And by the way. Um, you know, if you're working with a professional orchestra, they're not going to need any cues probably at all. But the point of a conductor, you know, one of the points is not just to give cues, but to emote what you want happening at that moment. And I, I really think if you lean into it and, and you, you, know, you really conduct the music in, in each section, they'll respond more beautifully than if you just ignore them to focus only on the chorus. Um, so, yeah, just scroll down to uh, that. That's the solo. I need to measure 19, Karina, when the chorus comes in. Good. Just be careful. The Italian thing is to be careful. It's not ich will euch. It's not ich will euch. No, ich will euch. You might even want to put a, a, a slight accent. Let's call it tenuto, a horizontal line. Uh, under TRO in measure 30, measure 20, I mean, because the sopranos are descending. In fact, all four parts, uh-oh, I learned in harmony, you don't 
have all four parts moving in the same direction and he breaks that rule oh my god but we'll allow that because he's brahms this is his longest work by the way he's real oish thurston you see that every all four parts go down to thur and um I'm not sure of the exact translation. If anybody wants to weigh in, I will see you or something you, Thurston. I know the general translation, but I want to see you again and your heart should rejoice. But anyway, if you were to speak this, even if you don't know what it means, ich will euch Thurston. So, so yeah, a little bit of an accent. Um, and again, v, going on after that, be einen seine mut, it's mutter, not mutter, thirst it. You know, and then it depends what part of Germany you're from. Some people say like S I N D is sint, like in Bavaria, and others in like Hochdeutsch would be sint. So you, I think, I think, you know, Brahms was in Vienna. We, I think we want to do the Hochdeutsch. Okay. I mean, I can go on forever, but uh, time is basically up. You have any questions for me? general or specific? I do. I okay. do. So the Tenuto mark, uh, you, and you, 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 you want it to be an accent mark, but basically probably because a lot of people consider it an accent mark. Well, you, Rick, you probably weren't here when I explained the difference and why would you have been? Because uh, well, it could no, have been like six weeks ago. I think I was. I think I was. Okay, well, I'm just saying that every professional singer I've ever worked with in New York City, I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of them, consider a horizontal line to be a slight accent. It has nothing to do with the length. It's a slight accent and the sidewards V is a, a pure, you know, heavier accent, that's all. Yeah, I, I always wonder about that because it's not really, right? I mean, that line is not, an accent, literally, uh, but people take it to be. Uh, are, is that what you're saying? That you kind of gave in to what they're, they're thinking? No, it's not so much I gave in. First of all, if you look in the dictionary, it says what? Hold it as uh, full, full length uh, and maybe even longer. It's full huh? value. To make sure yeah, you hold it for its but, full value. Yeah, so I say, I say to you, I posit this, what singer wouldn't hold a note its full value? In other words, they're supposed to hold notes full value. So um, it's just a way that, uh, and I'm not arguing with you, I mean, if right, that's the right. but it's just a way to indicate that it's a slight accent. And that's what singers in New York uh, have accepted. Yeah. And because they, you know, I know what you're saying. That that concept that some people don't hold the note fully is why some composers put in four four time a whole note tied to an eighth, right? Because they want to make sure they hold it to the downbeat. But then, what if they really want the singers to hold it for four and a half beats? Then they're screwed. Yeah. So the tenuto mark would solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but then but then how would you indicate slight accent? And, and the problem is solved at the first rehearsal. You'll tell them, you tell them, hold every God, uh, no, no, <laughs> no value and stop uh, slouching off at the end. You know? <laughs> and that solves it. That solves it. Yeah. Anybody else? Rick is a, Rick, I think I gave you an A. I can always change it to a D if you keep asking. Oh man, this. come on. My, my permanent record, Ooh. you're gonna change <laughs> my permanent record. <laughs> yes, Donald. Uh, Dom. Dom. Uh, Donald on the screen. I know you're Dom. Yeah, that's okay. If I'm not mistaken, I think both Verdi and Brahms made their big hit with their requiems, correct? Well, yeah. Uh, his requiem, as I said last week, is some call it his best opera. It's hmm. a great, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think you're right, you know? He certainly put his heart and soul into this piece. Yep. 
I mean, when I conducted the Verdi Requiem in Italy, I'm telling you, it was they just loved this piece. And then as an encore, we did, uh, you know, Va Pensiero, which, you know, va, da, 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 which, um, you know, they they consider their national anthem. And the whole, I turned around, the whole audience sang it by heart. <laughs> it was a great event. So. Awesome. Well, thank you all yeah. so much. Please remember that Harold is available by email just because this, you know, our Zoom session's over does not mean that you cannot reach out with any of your questions regarding this Brahms Requiem, any of the pieces we've done before, or honestly, any questions that you have for Harold in general, um, email him at haroldrosenbaum at gmail.com. And um, he will set up a time to meet with you via phone or Zoom meeting, which is just an awesome opportunity. Thank you, Harold, so much. Um, check out our Q&A next week on Thursday um, for uh, Harold's Q&A that he's hosting. And then if not, we will see you in two weeks from now. Um, everyone have a good election day next Tuesday and um, we'll see you all then. Thank you, Harold. And what? Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, actually, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you planning to do two weeks from now? Oh, so two- If you're planning. That's a great question. Well, first of all, you go to nyvirtuoso.org, nyvirtuoso.org, and you do a few clicks, you'll see the whole schedule for through through May. Oh, I forget. I forget what I'm doing. And uh, the session, the is, I think. Okay. What is it? Most all right, I'll try to do uh, that. Uh, I just have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Alessandro, yes. welcome. Uh, I was wondering, you know, just in, in, in a general sense about consideration of balance between the voices, but, you know, but from the voices to the uh, orchestra, and if there are any places where that might not be so, so obvious, like in the sense of perhaps certain orchestral instruments being more, more equal to the voices at times instead of simply below the voices, if you have, if there are thoughts about that, uh, that in certain places. That's a tricky one. I think I think right. Brahms really builds it in. Yeah, I think Brahms builds it in. I mean, you always have to be careful of, uh, you know, trombone players playing too loud. I remember once um, when I was training, I trained my choir for the Bard, Bard Festival and they were doing uh, Mahler's Eighth. And there were 120 professional singers and 120 players. And the conductor couldn't get the trombones to stop being obnoxiously loud. So in the dress rehearsal, <laughs> it happened to be a chair next to uh, the third trombonist, an empty, uh, just sat down there. And, and at the first moment I had when they stopped playing and the conductor was talking to the violinist or something, I said to the, I just turned to the guys risking their wrath. And I said, do you guys really wanna drown, drown out the chorus here? You know, I was really like showing I was pissed. And, you know, and one of them just stared at me, the other one, no, no, no. And I think he toned it down for the concert. But as far as your, your specific question goes, yeah, it's built in, but um, if you have enough singers, if you have at least 150 singers to, you know, 75 players, you'll be fine. If you have only 100 singers per 75 players, you might, you might want to tone down this orchestra and, you know, and, and especially when the brass is playing loudly, you have to, you have to. It's, it's, a, work. it's a interesting because I mean, basically I was referring more to like sp specific places. I mean, it's, it's probably not, not, not the most opportune time now, but like any specific places where some of the orchestral instruments would be more equal in volume to the, to the choir rather than more of an accompaniment role. Uh, that, that was actually one of the, yeah. you know, something I was thinking about, but then another question that came to mind um, was when you were talking about the area in that movement where it's ambiguous as to where the tempo should change from the upbeat to the to the downbeat of the measure. Um, I was wondering like, if, if that place repeats later on in the in the requiem that perhaps it, there, there could be like a more like a, a there could be a different effect if the uh, tempo would remain the original tempo before before the downbeat. Like it, it could give a more reflective yeah. effect. I mean, I was considering. Yeah, it can go. Yeah, I, it's a very good point, and that can go both ways, though. I mean, you can do it 
a little bit differently each time. You can do it the same each time. Oops. I think I think it's like in the Baroque where you have forte going to piano, and now we know it's not so much that it has to be a, a you know very much contrast at the moment, but there are also there are shades of gray. There are fifty shades of gray, G rated, and hmm. uh, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Great. Good points. Okay, Good points. Yes. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.